I think I see we have everyone so we can get started. So greetings from Garmisch Partakirchen uh, from the Marshall Center. I'm Valbona Zanelli and I'm delighted to moderate this panel with very distinguished speakers. I'd like also to thank my co-moderator, uh, Ms. Valeska Esch, uh, the Deputy Director of Aspen Institute that will be uh, supporting also this process, will be co-moderating uh, together. Uh, let me start by really thanking the German um, Ministry, the German Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Aspen Institute Germany, and the Southeastern European Association for this terrific event, and for focusing on the security challenge for the Western Balkans, brain drain, and the massive emigration from the region. The European Union is addressing this issue, and Germany has made it focus of its presidency of the EU, as we heard yesterday in the opening speech from the foreign minister of Germany, Heiko Maas. I believe what is amazing about this virtual conference is that it is focused on young people, but most importantly, their voices are heard. And I think perhaps this is for the first time in this magnitude. This allows us all, I think the out of the box thinking and coming up with innovative solution in addressing these challenges. Migration from the Western Balkans towards the West is caused primarily by high economic and institutional despair. With income and institutional quality differentials still wide and actually widening, the push and the pull factors driving emigration will likely persist even stronger in the future. This panel is comprised of very distinguished speakers and will focus on the very core issues that push people to emigrate from the region, such as corruption, lack of hope for the future, lack of meritocracy, lack of transparency, but also lack of inclusiveness of young people in political processes. Western Balkans policymakers often complain that their best minds are leaving. Complaints, but not really new ideas. So they do so without offering any solution on how to fix this problem. They clearly pertain to tackling the huge deficits in proper governance and high levels of corruption, which is exactly, I'll say, how the insiders, which means those in power, tend to prefer it. After all, I think, you know, the cynics will think that migration is used sometimes as political protection. In other words, to keep things precisely as they are. Um, I'm glad that although it's five o'clock in the afternoon and everybody has had a very busy, though very interesting day in this virtual conference, we still have more than 100 participants with us. So this is great. So please stay with us until the end of the panel. It will be very interesting. And we hope that we'll be able to answer some of your questions. By now, you know how it works, uh, the chat function and also the Q&A function but also the waving hand function if you would like to ask that question or make that comment directly uh, um, to the, in this conference. Well, let me start by uh, offering the floor to our first uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Dr. Mark Marko Kmesic, the senior researcher at the Center for Southeast European Studies at University of Graz. Uh, Dr. Kmesic, you are a well-known expert uh, expert when it comes to good governance and democracy uh, in the Western Balkans. And also you are one of the authors of the study shaping the stabilocracy term that everybody, you know, the scholars are using over the last uh, few years. In a short analysis of the push and the pull factors of emigration from the Western Balkans, so focusing more on the push factors, and that's the topic, that's the core, you know, mission also of this panel. Uh, as we look at the poor opportunities for young people, bad governance, lack of transparency and accountability, but also other structural issues in the social system, such as education, health, all these issues were discussed also in the previous panels. Uh, do you think that we have enough data to do a good analysis of these push and pull factors? And then my second uh, point of the question will be, um, how is the established stabilocracy in the region pushing people away from their home countries? Right. Uh, thanks. Uh, th those are really some excellent questions and uh, excellent starting points uh, to which um, I would like to comment in the next five minutes. 
And uh, to start with the first question that really caught my attention, um, I, I agree that uh, it is precisely the lack of uh, clear evidence <clears throat> that can show us uh, various reasons for the decision of uh, Western Balkans, well, Western Balkan country citizens to emigrate, uh, uh, because um, and and here I, I I've prepared a list of some six key points where I was actually trying to provide evidence um, uh, with regard to exactly these issues that you were mentioning. So the lack of good governance, uh, clientelism, lack of transparency with the decision of the people to leave. And uh, basically, uh, I wanted to start with uh, uh, some of the questions that were asked uh, by the Regional Cooperation Council in their Balkan Barometer. I'm positive that we have mentioned them quite often uh, over the past two days, but nevertheless, um, I'm just gonna brief, briefly touch, on, touch up on some of them. Uh, so uh, when asked about uh, the opinion of what is the most important thing for getting a head start in life, uh, most of the respondent, uh, respondents uh, from the Western Balkans actually claimed that it is neither the good education or the family background, it's actually who uh, knowing the right people. So who do you know? Uh, are you close to the elites that are currently governing the Western Balkan countries? So that was the predominant answer, that was the understanding of the setting of how the game is played uh, in the Western Balkans. So education is not uh, uh, respected. Uh, it is not even your family background, your status, which provides you a good starting point in your life. It, it is actually playing the game of uh, clientelism and entering the circle of, uh, uh, of nepotism, uh, which is being rewarded. And this is the, this is, uh, acknowledged by many, most of the respondents of the RCC uh, uh, barometer. Then uh, a second question, uh, which actually might lead us into the right direction of gathering the evidence uh, is the attitude towards what constitutes the major problem in the Western Balkans. And here to get the clear picture, we would need to look back some five years uh, um, in, the, in the past and see the response, responses of the Western Balkan citizens where, uh, where in 2015 they claimed that the biggest problem in the Western Balkans is unemployment, which is followed by corruption and emigration or migration was nowhere to be seen on these, uh, on these uh, 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 ballots. Only five years later, so in the present moment, it is the corruption that is widely recognized as the biggest problem in the Western Balkans it is now followed by migration. So the legal migration of the uh, Western Balkan citizens to the EU and other uh, rich countries of the world, not the, uh, not the migration, uh, uh, which is now <clears throat> maybe the bigger concern for the EU. So the migration from the Middle East and uh, Southern Africa. Uh, now, and only then uh, the unemployment is, is acknowledged as one of the major problems uh, by Western Balkan citizens. So where does this lead us? Uh, it leads us to, to understanding that it is actually the corruption, uh, it is actually uh, uh, nepotism and clientelism. They're creating this, this, this uh, uh, ground for rising inequalities between the people. And therefore, uh, when asked about the gap between richer and poor, uh, whether it is increasing, uh, then, those are surging numbers where uh, uh, almost 90% in Albania, uh, respondents in Albania uh, acknowledge the increase of the gap between rich and poor in, the, in their country. And the least positive responses were gathered in Kosovo, but still this is almost 70% of the respondents. So basically this is now the setting where, where um, the game is being played. And uh, obviously, uh, some, some maybe 10 or 15 years ago, big hopes were invested in the U European Union future, uh, whereby it would provide some uh, means of the good governance, rule of law, etc., and decrease this gap. Uh, but now the game is also, uh, in this regard, changed. 
uh, and when asked the question about what would the EU membership mean to you directly, then actually uh, most respondents uh, claimed that this would be uh, the ability to uh, freely travel uh, for work and study in the EU. So it is no longer social protection. It is no longer peace and stability. It is simply a uh, simplified way to leave the region and uh, continue onwards with uh, a pursuit of a better life. Uh, now, uh, this, this is now the setting in, in which we are uh, functioning and in, in, in which the game is being played. And I would like to be optimistic uh, at the end of the uh, introductory uh, uh, note from my side, but I would also like to lay down some uh, independent variables, which also need to be concerned uh, apart from the good governance and the rule of law. And these are uh, uh, the facts that concern, first of all, demography. Uh, even without migration, uh, demographic situation in the region is uh, actually dreadful. And according to the UN study, by 2050, almost 40% of uh, the, re the, the population would be lost uh, in the Western Balkans. Then secondly, due to the consequence of the global warming, uh, the temperature by 2050 would increase in the region for 2%. And this would obviously have uh, very, very dire consequences for the agriculture uh, and uh, knowing that the, 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 the economy of the Western Balkans is still pretty much uh, relying on the agriculture, this would also have uh, uh, unintended and, and bad consequences towards the uh, migration. And uh, acknowledging these problems, also the problem of lack of, de of, of the demographic problem, we need to acknowledge that one thing is still rising in the, in the Western Balkans, and this is the international debt. Uh, someone will still have to pay for uh, the debt, uh, which is only, only increasing. So as you can imagine, there will be less people in the region, but they will have to bear the costs of uh, today's uh, uh, credit lines. So uh, where do I go with all this? Uh, I see that uh, the, the trend of migration in the region will obviously continue. Uh, it has been present over the past uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, it used to be the wars and unemployment, which were the main drive for the people to leave the region. Nowadays, uh, it, is, it is, again, something else. Uh, and this is the, 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 the uh, despair with uh, the failure of transition, with the failure of the region to catch up with the uh, European, Uni European Union as, as full member, and also the failure to um, um, make this uh, catch up in terms of the economy and other uh, economic uh, aspects of transition with the with the eu 27. Uh, so thank you. yeah okay. thank you marco well thank you very much great points and i already know that there's interest in the chat and there are raised hands so i'm pretty sure we'll come to each of your uh, issues right. that you raised uh, uh, in the conversation but I like, you know, what you said. Um, I already have questions for for you, so maybe you can think that for for later. So why why are we talking about brain drain nowadays? Is it become is it an issue that the civil society is raising and the internationals and young people, or really policymakers are concerned with this issue? So maybe we'll discuss that uh, even later. Maybe we need to find a new term for transition. I don't think it's a transition anymore. It's been too long. It's thirty years. So. Uh, well, let's coin a new term maybe by the end of this uh, of this panel. Uh, and let me uh, go to the, our second uh, speaker, Ms. Daffy Pechi. She holds the position of the Secretary General of the National Youth Congress in Albania, an umbrella organization that comprises 112 youth organizations. So Dafina, in your excellent paper that I hope that all the participants have had the chance to read it uh, beforehand, you make a very good uh, point regarding the importance of inclusiveness in policymaking for young people. And that was an issue that came a lot of times during the conference today, but also you point out the need for a new narrative. So my question is simple. What should, that, what should this narrative be about and how it should be supported with the right programs. The floor is yours.
Thank you very much, Ms. Zanelli, for your intro and for your good words. And I want to um, greet all the panelists and all the people which are participating till now uh, and are listening to us carefully. So um, before I go to the answer, which it's quite complicated, even that the question is quite simple, I want to mention the fact that according to the Balkan Barometer, 50% of young people in the region did not even discuss options that could affect government decision making, and as many as 32% did not care for it at all. This was an alarming indicator that things needed to change to bring young people closer to decision making processes. Following the commitment taken in Sofia summit, um, let's say through a huge project, which is called Western Balkan Youth Lab, which has already started, being the proof of continuous increase of Western Balkans government's attention on youth issues for providing space for innovative policy making, addressing the needs of young people and tackle brain drain issue. The three years project will establish Western Balkan youth labs. And this is a very good incentive to um, decrease the numbers of those young people which are unwilling or do not have the proper capacities or the proper means to participate meaningfully in very important uh, decision-making processes or political processes. There have been a lot, of, a lot of existing incentives and a lot of successful initiatives that have contributed to the improving situation of, of young people in Western Balkan countries. And many of these are not known, not applied, and not fully understood. And I think that this is a starting point for the new narrative. Firstly, to know what is going on and to speak it, to speak upon it and to say it in a very simple and understandable language for young people. Because we know that it was mentioned before in the conference and I fully agree that when you talk about young people, you are talking about different perspectives. You are talking about different backgrounds. You are talking about those who live in urban areas, but those who live in rural areas as well. Those which are well educated and those which are completely out of social circles. And starting to talk in simple language and trying to explain those target groups in the proper way, what is going on and how they can live better in their community, how they can get developed, how they can get near to each other and, and coordinate in order to fulfill their needs, this is a starting point. This is the new narrative, what I'm talking about. And it's not only this, but it's, it's, it's one of the elements. A high number of initiatives alone does not guarantee outcomes and results. And this is one of the things that my paper has presented. What is noticeable is that actors are isolated and not well connected with each other. And this fact needs to change. Even through the work of non-governmental organizations in the region is impressive. And I want to congr congratulate them all for the good work that they do. And I don't take the negative examples. I'm talking about those proper organizations which have been working in decades to improve the community, to improve the policies, to be partners, constructive partners of the institutions to improve their performances. And there still is a better need, is a need for a better co coordination among these stakeholders and the implementation of initiatives to ensure sustainability and well being, especially for the younger generations. These examples of achievements and good practice listed in the national reports or international reports are not presented in a systematic way and not everyone knows about it. This does not allow for continuous learning and the designing of new programs and initiatives based on past good practices. It also does not guarantee a comprehensive involvement of stakeholders such as academia, civil society, business community, and etc. I think that it is a common knowledge for all of us that sometimes when we try to tackle a certain issue, we talk only with a target group, but the target group in its own cannot do anything. The need for cooperation, for co-governance, for partnership among civil society actors and institutions, it's very much needed. We have to sit down and talk th things openly to see for common ways of a constructive work to have a proper communication. If things are going to be projected in European and regional level in a very, very uh, professional way, a very well thought way, but this is not translated in how the local level is, is, is designing its policies and how the central level is communicating it to the people, then I don't see any matching point and I can guarantee that doesn't matter how, how beautiful it looks, it will not work and people will not know about it. 
So how to translate? I think we are lost in translation for 30 years. There are some people, some decision makers, some very good um, technicians, uh, people working in administration, which do a wonderful job, but they, they are the only one that know what is going on. So this need to communicate and to, to, to co-work and to co-design, it's, it's very important. When designing future strategies, a result-oriented approach should be adopted. And this is what I was also trying to mention. Local ideas and forms of engagement should be put in the front front, forefront of the activities. To realize um, all these recommendations, there have been a lot of work being done. And I can say that Western Balkan countries have already started to work towards laying the foundations for the preparation of the next phase of regional economic integration agenda, which is a very good and important point. And it is expected to be endorsed uh, by Western Balkan leaders in the upcoming uh, Berlin Process Summit in autumn 2020. We should not forget that youth has been a very important and inter integral part since Berlin Summit to the Zag uh, Zagreb Summit. And there was dedicated a space in the agenda for young people. And this is something we need to endorse, to understand and to use, to use it properly. Um, regional assessments and guidelines for legal adjustments. I can mention three points which are going yes, to- maybe, maybe you save some for the questions that and the, yes, the, sure. the Q&A later. Sure. Okay, just, so just to, uh, yeah, please go ahead. No, just to, to, to conclude because I, it will be like interrupted. I'm sorry if I, if I pass the minutes. Uh, Western Balkan Working Group on Access uh, to Study uh, established Western Balkan Framework Agreement on Access to Study, uh, which will be signed, and number of students with equal access to study within Western Balkan countries in increased. So there have been different uh, projects, different initiatives trying to tackle different issues, but with a regional approach, such as RICO, which is a wonderful um, project, and now I cannot call it project, but it is an institution trying to tackle this, the, the, the issues related to education, to digital innovation, and to, to labor market and, and, uh, and new jobs and startups and everything like that. But everything what happens there can be understood from us, which are 100, 200 people intending this conference and talking about, but we should all together find a way to translate this and to communicate this and to find the proper means for young people to get really engaged. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Daphina. Uh, great points, very comprehensive, you know, perspective, summary also of your paper. And, and as you pointed out, I mean, there is need for better strategic communication. Uh, there is need for better implementation. Actually, one of the biggest issues in the Western Balkans is that we have proliferation of initiatives. But when it comes to implementation, that's where the huge gap exists. And also my question for you, so you can think later, is that I know you have a, you know, you're working very good together with, you know, other youth organizations regionally, you have a big support from the international community, because as you mentioned, the Berlin process was the one to push towards looking more at the, at the youth. So we have to be grateful for that. But my question will be, do you feel that people that are responsible for taking the decisions, are they listening to you? Because at the end of the day, they will take the necessary decisions for, uh, for the future of youth. And we'll go to that later. Uh, so I'll, I'll pass the floor now to Lorenda uh, Cadriu. She is the representative of the Youth and Women Leadership Program, uh, Partners um, Kosova Center for Conflict Management in Pristina. Uh, the issue of brain drain is discussed heavily in the Western Balkans recently. From your experience, do you think politicians in the region that are talking about this big challenge right now, are they serious about it? Or do they really feel comfortable when young and smart leave the country, leave the region? Because that means that the demand for transparency and accountability will be reduced. And also, how is it for a young woman like you are uh, to live in the Western Balkans these days? And, and before you start, Lorenta, I would like again to congratulate the uh, organizers of this conference because I've never seen in any conference so many young people together. And that is, I think, you know, the future where we should look at. We should not talk about young people. We should listen to young people and get their feedback. So Lorenta, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Valbona. So hello, everyone. I am Yorinta. Uh, first, I, I need to say that I'm happy that you're having this conference in Zoom, because otherwise, if it, if it be in, in person, I would need to go through a lot of uh, difficult procedures to get my visa. So this is my first international event that I'm attending, and I'm feeling equal with, uh, with all in my participation. Uh, so yes, I am a youth worker for several years. And I started working uh, in advocacy and involving young people and minorities into the process of decision making. Uh, I started my, uh, my activism in my small municipality um, where I faced ma many basic problems uh, such as like uh, policymakers uh, wasn't ready to, to, to hear me, but I also I faced many problems to to find the, the proper person, authority to talk and discuss my problem, which mostly uh, I have been rejected or being told to go back to school. Uh, in my municipality, Fuskosova or Kosova Polje, I realized many uh, have active public activities happening for which young people have never been involved or being called to give their con contribution. So there was many processes that were going on, but we as young, young people were never called, were never invited. So uh, in a way, the, the authorities didn't uh, let us to own the process to our, to our city as uh, citizens of the, of the municipality. Uh, of course, I felt very frustrated and I felt really very discriminated from uh, my leaders and uh, that continued to, to make me feel bad when I realized that not all this thing doesn't happen only on, in my municipality, but also happens to the other municipalities, not only in Kosovo, but also to the other uh, uh, countries in, in the Western Balkans. Um, I started uh, also meeting other young people in, in my, my advocacy uh, campaign, young people uh, in my local level, central level, but also from the other countries in Western Balkan, where we, uh, I realized that we do face the same, the similar problems such as uh, corruption in the education system, uh, politicalization uh, in lab labor market, discrimination based in our ethnicity, uh, religion, sexual orientation, orientation, gender, and also excluded uh, because we are not part of the specific political party. Uh, being honest, we missed a lot of, uh, of opportunities from our uh, policy and decision makers to be part of a policy make making. And uh, of course that we felt left aside from, from our own leaders. Um, together with the civil society organization led, with, uh, led from uh, young people, local and central lo uh, uh, youth action councils, uh, we, we started to think critical and we thought that, uh, and started also to meet other young people and we have seen that there are many young people which don't know the benefit of uh, uh, having the, the, the public consultation and getting engaged with government. Therefore, they felt uh, uh, discriminated and the only, the only choices that they have seen was to leave their countries and to go to, the, to a place, to a country where they would feel uh, listened, important, and uh, people will value them for the uh, professional and person personalities. So we thought and we truly suggest that uh, our governments will need really to, to improve their, their public cons uh, consultation with, uh, with the civil society, especially young people, since Western Balkans are known to have a lot of youngsters in, in, in the country. So we will be able to share our ideas, we'll be able to discuss our problems, our issues that we do feel in, feel in daily basis. So we won't, have, we won't need to go somewhere else to, to, to find a proper solution. Um, what else we, we, uh, we have realized during this, uh, uh, this many experiences that we, we did have was the coordination among the stakeholders, the responsible stakeholders. We had the specific problem in our countries and we never know where, where we can address that problem, who is going to listen to us. Every department, every ministry was pointing uh, fingers to, to each other and we were left, uh, left aside from, uh, from them and disregard. Uh, I'm going to mention one uh, uh, one uh, thing that I have seen seen it and experienced it myself. There was a team of young people which were willing to uh, participate in scientific uh, event uh, in Europe, and uh, of course, as a young st a student, they could not afford the process of visa, the travel, and accommodation. 
uh, things. So they were asking from, for, for help from our ministry. So they, met, they were, were left in the middle of the Ministry of Youth, Culture and Sport, the Ministry of Education, Integration and the others, because they were putting fingers at the others that those youngsters should go to the other, to the other. So in the end, they could not go to participate because of the lack of this coordination, strong coordination of stakeholders, which they need to pre provide us help and information for the concrete things. Um, one can say that, uh, for example, me as a person, as a young person coming from a majority community here in Kosovo, and I'm facing all this problem. How is, the, how is uh, as a, a youngster from uh, minorities such as Roma, Ashkali, Egyptian, or LGBT plus community feel or experience those problems? And of course that there are many double standards used against them, against those youngsters coming and living here in the Western Balkan. Um, so though this is a bit from my experience and some of uh, the conclusions that uh, I suggest together with some of the, of the young people that I have working for, the, for those years. And for sure, young people from Balkan are really, are really good or critical thinker or innovator. And we can bring sustainable change to the Western Balkan and we can live in the peaceful and really develop great things all together here. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lorenda, for your comments. And very similar to Daphina, I mean, the question, the issue of lack of being heard, lack of inclusiveness uh, was mentioned also in, in your remarks. And of course, um, you know, in the second round also would like to look at more, you know, what you think the solutions will be. Uh, I know, you know, talking about issues and raising awareness is so important, but we cannot all stay and admire the problem as, uh, as it used to, to, you know, to be said. So what needs to be done and, you know, some of the practical steps that uh, also Daphina shared uh, are very important. I'd like now to give the floor to uh, Ms. Genoveva Ruiz Calavera. She is the director in charge of the Western Balkans at the DG Neighborhood and Enlargement uh, negotiations, the DG near. Uh, in this capacity, she's responsible for managing bilateral relations with all the regional countries of the Western Balkan Six, guiding and monitoring the progress towards the EU, also in the context of the stabilization and association uh, process. But also most importantly, I'll say also for this conversation here with young people, her portfolio includes promoting regional cooperation and providing support for the Western Balkans through the instruments of pre-accession assistance. So Ms. Calavera, it's great to have you with us today. Uh, we wanted to hear you at the very end because we wanted also you to listen to what um, experts uh, and young people from the region had to say. And I know that you have listened because that's part of the process in the Western Balkans. You always meet with youth and you know, other uh, uh, youth you know, organizations. And uh, I think that is very important that the EU is including these uh, problems, these challenges in the strategy. So how is the issue of brain drain from the Western Balkans seen from the European Union? But also what role do you think the Europeanization process plays into increasing inclusiveness in the region and also reducing those push factors for people to leave the region? We know that emigration is in, you know, it's a, it's push and pull factors. So right now the region or other areas in the world cannot do much to reduce the pull factors because they depend, you know, everybody wants a better life, wants, be wants better education. But what needs to be done to not push people away, to take this decision just to leave the country because they don't see opportunity. And then my final point will be if there are programs of the EU that support technically and financially also circular migration. The floor is yours, thank you. Thank you very much, Valbona. And let me uh, reiterate the comment that you made that is excellent to see in this um, conference, a lot of young steps, because when we talk about this problem, we talk about their future. And of course their future is for them to shape and, 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 and make sure that the policymakers understand their expectations. But I'm glad as well to have a lot of, uh, you know, comments and, and contributions from, from academics and, of course, uh, think tanks, because it's, it's important to have analysis that uh, guide uh, evidence-based policy. Uh, certainly, uh, brain drain is, a, is very high in our concern and our preoccupation, because uh, certainly not only because uh, when we think about the region and the percentage of, of the migrant stock on their populations, I mean, we're talking about 
situations that vary from 30% of the Kosovo people are immigrants to almost 50% of people from Bosnia Herzegovina. So these this are really horrendous amount of, of, of figures, which may, makes uh, us worried because the talent is, 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 is leaving uh, the region. And we need uh, the talent to make the region prosperous, to make the region, to consolidate democracies, to make sure that we, we have a, a better future for everybody in the region and in the European Union. So it's with great concern. And I, I would say that um, there are politicians that might be less concerned because there might be this is a good opportunity to have less talented people that can question their policies. But I think a lot of politicians are very concerned about it as well. They do realize that, uh, you know, the, the share of the working age population is, is in the next uh, decades are going to go down. And that, uh, you know, without a, a talented skill uh, workforce, you cannot uh, have a future in any country. So I think we have a common, uh, a common um, challenge uh, together, both uh, the EU, because we are part of this pull factor of, for the youngsters that, that, of course, want a better life, uh, and the region uh, to work together to ensure that, that the situation improves for all of us sake. And, and in particular, because I mean, I, I do believe that at the end of the day, people want to live uh, close to their families where they have been born. And of course, uh, you want to have the opportunity to, to live somewhere else if you want, but not to be forced to have to immigrate. And that is a very important part. I would like to say that in any case, a lot of uh, immigration, like you said, is related to you want a better life. And I fully agree with, with Marco that the better life is not only a better salary, which of course is very important when you are a young person. Uh, it is a better education, it is a better health system, it is certainly a, a, a judiciary system that works so that you can be protected as a citizen, your businesses can be given guarantees that they will not be abused, etc., etc., etc. So it's a very uh, complex, uh, create the conditions that we want to see. This is something as well we have to be realistic. We're still experiencing today. I mean, when you have a big economic gap, uh, even new member states are still heavily emigrating into the old member states where the economies are less. We see with satisfaction that it, we are starting to see 15 years after accession a reversing trend. So our uh, a lot of workers from, from the new member states are going back home because you know the situation is getting better from all points of view as well. So I agree with you, it's not a transition, it's a long transition, but it's part of what is happening, not only in the region, but in the European Union as well. And of course I come from a, now an old member state, but when I was a young member state, we saw it happening as well. And people want to, to, to move into better uh, pastures. What do we see? I mean, we see that we need to tackle this problem, not with one program, but with holistic approach. And that approach, I would say, uh, and that, four aspects that are structurally um, important to, look, to be looked at. First, of course, we have to, to, to close that gap, that economic gap. Today, the region is 50% of the European Union GDP. So this is something which we have to overcome. And that means we have to create jobs and, and we have to facilitate access for finance, for, for startups, for young entrepreneurs. For, for, for jobs for young people. So there is a, a, a job aspect. Second, of course, in order to create those jobs, we need to improve the skill sets of, of the people that have to access uh, to the market and employability of these young uh, men and women that, that want to have the jobs. Third, of course, we have to make the, the region more attractive for the young people. And that is what I think uh, that Dafina was saying very well. I mean, they have to participate in the decision-making process. They have to shape. Uh, how they want to see their future, they have to have a voice and the voice heard. And I'm very happy that the FINA was already changing the narrative because I don't have to talk about this program. She was talking about the youth labs, she was talking about the regional youth organization, uh, cooperation office, all that is funded by the European Union. And, and we are making sure that, that we really support and push uh, uh, this, this approach. But fourth, and that goes back to what Marco and Loretta were saying as well, we have to make sure that all these efforts are underpinned by, by real the reforms on what we call the fundamentals. And the fundamentals is, of course, the consolidation of democracies, the respect of the human rights and fundamental rights of people, the, the, the rule of the law, the, the, the consolidation of the rule of the law, and certainly, uh, the, you know, the functioning public administrations. So the things we have been heard about merit uh, to be recognized, to be recruited, 
And I, I always read with great interest the, the Balkan barometer because this is a very good exercise as well that we fund with the Regional Cooperation Council. Because for us, it's very important that the EU policies that are being implemented in the region is not the EU implementing policies in the region, it's the region implementing the policies they think they need with the support of the, of the EU. And that's why we try to work as much as possible with all the existing regional uh, organizations like the Regional Cooperation Council, not only, and with, of course, civil society organizations and with homegrown initiatives that can make sure that that narrative that, that uh, Defina was mentioned is explained by the people from the region, not by people like me of outside. Uh, I, I, I believe that it, it's extremely important that, that we work on, on that narrative as well. And, and I, I will go to back, I mean, we have, we're launching new programs, so the voice, of the people from the region, and in particular, the voice of the youth can be heard, explaining what they expect from their politicians, explaining as well what they expect from the EU, and explaining as well what is the benefit of this transformation that the process of EU approximation brings to the citizens. Because at the end of the day, you know, preparing a country for accession is not something abstract. It's really preparing that the citizens have you know, the capacity to be respected in their, in their rights, and of course, uh, to, to honor their obligations to be a member of this club. I don't want to talk more because probably it's better that we respond to, to questions and answers, but I, I can talk about the programs after if you want. Valgona. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Calavera, and thank you for the programs that you mentioned that are fostering this, you know, uh, the youth voices to be heard. That's very important. This is first they need to be heard and then included in the process of, of policy making. And you pointed out a very important factor, which is the core of why people leaving are institutional issues. It's not just economic. Those can be fixed, or those are those that you know exist throughout the world. So how can we fix the institutional issues? I once heard a very wise man say that it's not poverty that pushes people away from their home countries. It's lack of hope. And then how do we work together you know, with these programs that make people feel that there is hope for prosperity and a better future in their countries. This was a great first, uh, first round. Uh, I already have here three hands that are raised. So I'd like to start with G. Steinacker. He also wrote uh, the, the question in the chat. So please, uh, Mr. Steinacker, if you would like to take the floor to ask the question. We can see your name, yeah, oh, okay. Yes, uh, okay. it's not uh, Mr., it's Mrs. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm a former German diplomat uh, who spent many years in various Balkan countries. Um, yes, uh, you see the question I asked uh, already, and uh, actually I wouldn't, do not want to explain what can, uh, the all the co of the conference was very interesting and I agree with you that it was particularly, hello? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear. Yes. And it was particularly important um, uh, to hear all these young voices and, and the concerns uh, they bring forward regarding the, the situation seems a little bit to be stuck. And as we have here the uh, desk officer from the European Commission, um, and I talked to some of her predecessors some years ago, um, I have the feeling the process, despite the new methodology, is somehow stuck with the EU um, enlargement. And uh, I would like to hear from her, except for some very nice and also important uh, programs and funds, um, what uh, will the EU do about this uh, tremendous problem uh, regarding uh, corruption and uh, elites, which I at least partly not seem not to be interested in changing the state of affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you Schneinacher. So I think that question will go to um, Mrs. Calavera. So what should the EU change, EU change in the policy towards the Western Balkans to overcome the shortcomings of the enlargement process? So it looks like there is an enlargement fatigue, but also reform fatigue uh, in the region. Do you want I answer now? Yes, yes, please. Thanks. Uh, look, I was looking at the at the at the other questions that are in the in the web. 
Look, I, I think we, we have to get, break this uh, sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that there's a lunch fatigue and the reform not happening, so we are so all so unhappy. I'm sorry. We have seen a lot of change since last year. I mean, we have seen a, a new dynamic in the process, as, at least from the EU side. We had a lot of difficulties last year. We had discussions on the future opening of accession negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia stuck for a while. I mean, we have started this year with a different dynamic. We have started this year with a revised enlargement methodology that takes much more emphasis on, on the issues that you know that our diplomat colleague has mentioned, on the need of those structural reforms in the rule of the law aspects and the aspect that really will change this, this perception of the region. And that has given much more of a policy um, steer to our EU member states because it is coming to the European Union. It's a two-way process. The countries need to take the lead in making sure that their state uh, objective to become member states translate in very concrete, very measurable reforms that we can report every year in our enlargement package reports. But of course, the EU has to be uh, as well uh, very capable of giving clear um, uh, guidance and clear uh, path to the region. And I think what we, when we see that after we put this revised methodology in February on the, on the table, in March, our EU member states agreed to unblock uh, the, the discussions for, for a negotiation mandate so we can start negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia. This is a fantastic uh, message for the whole region that the alignment policy is still there and is still going in the right direction. And I tell you, I mean, I have soon uh, Dafina knows me from, from Albania. I am the chair of the governing board, which is following the, the, the judicial reform with this vetting of judges. I mean, this is unprecedented uh, and it's happening in Albania and it's happening every day. So there's a lot of things that are going on. There's a lot of challenges ahead of us. I don't hide it. And that's why if you look at our enlargement reports, we don't sugarcoat. We say what has happened in the right way and we give due credit where the credit is due, but we as well uh, identify the issues that they still need to improve or that they haven't improved for a certain time. And, and I think this is the best thing we can do for the countries in the region. When we think in particular that we have several countries in the region that have new governments in formation and we can give them very clear guidance of what we expect from those new governments to foster the reform agenda that is needed to, to get uh, towards the European Union. I think the best thing that we can do is to be honest, because this is uh, what we need. I mean, confidence that we will give honest advice and that, of course, that honest advice will be taken uh, and, and run with it. There is no shortcut for accession. It's through fulfilling the criteria. And this is what I think uh, we keep repeating and there is no overall whole to that uh, reality. But I, I, I think we have as well uh, collectively to help uh, uh, that there is much more em impetus and emphasis and, 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 and motivation to do those reforms. Those reforms are difficult, we know them, but I, I do agree that those reforms have to be well explained uh, to the citizens and how those reforms will bring them clear benefit. And I tell you, we, we believe that those reforms shouldn't be just felt at the end, the day the countries are coming in, but every day in the lives of the citizens. I, I, I just uh, want to, to say, because I have this impression that we contribute to this bleak uh, environment. It is difficult. It is challenging. We have a lot to do, and the countries have a lot to do. But it, it is only by, you know, rolling our sleeve and get the work done, not by just complaining about all the difficulties, but by confronting them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments. And um, maybe we'll discuss even further that uh, not only the institutions of the, you know, the European Union, but the countries, the governments themselves have to do a better job in communicating with, strategic communicating with the public and making it clear and honest about the, you know, about these reforms. Uh, this panel has a lot of interest. We have uh, six questions in the Q&A and two uh, raised hands. So what I'd like to uh, suggest is that we'll hear the first two questions uh, and then we'll uh, hear the questions in the Q&A, some of them two or three and then we'll go through the panel so we have time to uh, talk about everything. So uh, let me give the floor to David Weil. David, 
David, can you hear us? Hello? Okay, uh, I think we lost David. Uh, how about Judith uh, Finel? I think there's something wrong with um, with the, so let's go to, I'd like to then ask Valeska, we can start with some of the questions that uh, we have received in the Q&A. Valeska, can you hear me? Yes, um, sure. Um, we have quite, uh, received quite a few questions. Um, I have one from Lola Paunovic from the European Policy Center in Belgrade, which is addressed to uh, both Genoveva and Marco. And she asks, how do you see the newly published European Commission country reports influencing migration patterns within the region due to stagnation and limited progress on uh, key chapters 23 and 24, but also the new funding opportunities through IPA 3? Do you think this will drive or stall migration? Um, and I have another one also for Marco, um, coming from Theresia Tögelhofer. Um, I fully agree with your point that recruitment based on nepotism is extremely frustrating for young people and discouraging them to build their career and lives in the Western Balkans. Do you think that nepotism will decline in the years to come once younger generations gain more influence in society and start doing things differently? Or are they rather co-opted by the system and will they rely on nepotism themselves? And I have um, a further question um, to Dafina and, and, and probably also Lorenta, because she already mentioned um, some of that. It's coming from uh, Milica Trepcha, uh, IOM expert seconded to Migration Asylum Refugees Regional Initiative. And she asks, when it comes to inclusive policymaking, could you bring up a few examples? How do youth organizations in the Western Balkans take into account the views and perspectives of vulnerable youth, like youth with disabilities or minor, minor to youth. Well, thank you. Thank you, Valeska. Uh, let's start with Marco. Marco, so there are two questions that were directed to you. The first one is the um, argument that you used about youth and nepotism. And I could see not only in the chat, but also in the, not only the Q&A, but also in the chat function that, function that a lot of people were agreeing with you that that's kind of the rule in the Western Balkans. So the question is how that will change in the future with the EU integration process. Uh, and um, yeah, let's start with you. Uh, I would need a crystal ball, obviously, to answer that question. Um, uh, I can only speculate uh, and uh, connect the facts. And I can see that uh, <clears throat> the new generation of politicians or the new elites have not emerged in the region since the beginning of the uh, 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 transition, wherever you put it. I, I'm not going to go into that. So wherever there is a start, I mean, we're still in the in the same pattern and same elites. Uh, and uh, I do not see that they're um, leaving any room for the new elites to to take floor. Uh, uh, moreover, uh, they're, they're trying their best to implement their ideas, their values uh, on the new generations as well. So I, I'd rather I'd rather speculate it's the second, uh, the latter, so that they will include the new generation into the pattern of clientelism, nepotism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so uh, in a way, it is a vicious circle which uh, uh, cannot be dismantled uh, without dismantling the whole system. Uh, I'm, I'm quite a revolutionary when it comes to the changes in the Balkans, and uh, I do not see that uh, it, it makes sense to tackle this particular problem or uh, uh, to try and hope for the best by the new generation. But then again, uh, connecting this to the second question, uh, I do see I do I do see a potential. Uh, basically, what uh, there was a question: what EU can do, and the the, the to clarify what is the impact of the new uh, prog progress reports. Uh, basically, I do not see how new progress reports actually contribute or wh what is the connect. They do not slow down migration, to say the least. Um, obviously, uh, I think that the EU 
we, we are talking, you know, it's Chatham House and we are all saying we should be honest about this. We should be honest about this. So in a way, we sh they, you should be honest in, call, in calling a spade a spade. Uh, and if you look at the progress reports, because that was a question, you see that the language in progress reports is quite different than the language the EU is using in their uh, strategy papers, um, whereby their language is much more, you know, it's deprived of diplomatic uh, uh, words and diplomatic notions. They say Western Balkans is a clear case of uh, a st uh, captured states. So what exactly do we, d does the EU see uh, as elements of captured state? And uh, that is a great di diagnosis of the problem. But then what is the recipe uh, to improve the situation? I see that uh, here is uh, something that the progress reports are uh, falling short of providing the recipe uh, in terms of uh, clearer benchmarks to be met when we talk about not only rule of law, but also democracy. I, I see that these two should be, should be analyzed uh, interche not only interchangeably, as uh, it is currently the case, so it's used to move the goalposts, uh, but simply to create clear benchmarks for both uh, uh, democracy and the rule of law in the region. And also calling a spade a spade. Uh, sometimes, you know, you cannot deal with uh, uh, governments and uh, those elites that are uh, obviously uh, capturing their states and their institutions. So in this regard, uh, 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 stopping or putting on hold uh, membership negotiations would be, I think, a favorable scenario. Uh, there is also a lot of money involved in terms of uh, funds that are used in the, in the Balkans. And these funds at, in this circumstance should be diverted to, to support civil society and try and support these new elites that Teresia has uh, mentioned as uh, part of the answer to the problem. Mm -hmm. well, well, thank you, Marco, for pointing out these issues. And, uh, and thank you for bringing up the issue of democratic backsliding in the region. So we haven't mentioned that so much. We have seen since 2008, we have this democratic backsliding. But also one of the phenomena that we see in the region is where we have weak institutions and strong leaders. And this is a vicious cycle that does not really allow the development of, of strong uh, institutions in the region. But it'll be interesting to listen to the perspective of Ms. Calavera on these issues. Thank you very much. I mean, let me go back to what Marco was saying. I mean, for me, it's clear that our reports don't influence positively or negatively per se. <laughs> because migration is a complex issue. But I think our reports, the national reports, provide a snapshot of the situation in the region, in each of the countries of the region, which is factual. It's factual and it's, it's honest. I mean, I, I, these are reports from institutions. So of course, they are not reports from think tanks that you can be much more you know, colorful. We are institutions. We work on institutional language. But I think they are very factual and very clear. And we have very clear recommendations to the authorities. But it is the authorities that have to define the recipes of how to implement our recommendation. It's it not us. I mean, and there's no one size fits all. What needs to be done in the rule of law in Bosnia and Herzegovina is slightly different than what needs to be done in, in Albania or, or, or in Serbia. So I think we have to be realistic as well. The recommendations of the report are for the authorities and for the institutions of the region. They have the obligation to, to see the move with them and to move forward. And of course, civil society has to play its role by making sure that you do not only your watch uh, role uh, in making sure that the authorities feel, uh, you know, the, 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 the need and the pressure to do the things uh, faster, but as well uh, get the support from civil society as well, because the role of civil society can be very supportive to the institutions. I, I, I really uh, totally disagree that our funds just support the elites. Our funds support the citizens of the region. And that's why the EU comes with significant funding to this region, to help the institutional frameworks that need to be there, to help the democratization, to help the civil society organizations, to help you know, the infrastructure development that we want to see. So, and this is done for the people of the region. And, that's what, and it is done certainly in the interest, not only of the people of the region, but in the interest of the EU, because the more the region progresses, the more the region consolidates, uh, the better is the situation. When you look at the map, it's clear that the EU cannot uh, let this region on its own devices. I mean, you are part of our geographic space, certainly you're part of our past and you're part of our destiny. 
but but I think it, it is extremely important that, that, that we do realize that the onus is in every country of the region and that we have the collective effort to support that the, the need that the, what needs to be done is done and I think from that point of view I fully agree that our reports are not very colorful in language but are very clear Thanks. okay thank you uh, I'd like to take the to give the floor to uh, Marina Harapin and then we'll continue with uh, Elion Kolchaku and uh, I think I also saw the German ambassador to Albania, Ambassador Peter Zinkroff. Marina? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, this is a, rather a comment and maybe, I don't know, maybe I spark someone's uh, interest to answer or, or to tell me differently. Um, I just want to shortly say my story. I, I know Marco from University of Maastricht and I, I follow you a lot. I'm doing a PhD in Barcelona on Western Balkans and I moved from Balkans eight years ago and uh, I don't remember who but some of you are saying yeah we have to put our sleeves up and you know we have to get to work like there is a lot of motivation I hear and I'm really impressed with young people staying in the Balkans and and really working you know towards uh, tackling any of the issues because wherever you wherever you start where you grasp more than a surface you you get you get some hurdles and, and, you, and you have to really work and you really have to fight. Um, I was a journalist in Croatia and then, and then in Germany and then in Netherlands, etc. And now my life path brought me to Barcelona. I'm 29. I left like eight years ago. And whenever I wanted to go back to Croatia, I noticed at some point that um, it was just as a journalist, as someone, you know, as someone who wanted to actually work for to inform young people and I, I was working for websites for young people and we had this idea these startups and everything it was just impossible to pay the rent for me like I'm just now because there are many people listening I, I would I would be able to live in a so-called souterrain you know like in half a basement uh, with, a, with the amount of money they offered me from creation public radio television uh, from Hrvatska Radio Televizija and it was it, and I was just, I was faced with this choice that I really wanted to help and I really wanted to be there, you know, to, to, to be there with these people. And I have networking of people I know and I wanted to work there, but it was just impossible for me to like, I mean, my existential worries were, you know, I didn't want to ask my parents and live with them until I'm 35 or something. So I had to, I had to leave and, uh, and it was a beautiful leaving because I've met different European countries and everything. But you know, that's Rina, the if you can get to the point, please. We have so many questions online. Yeah, well, my idea is how can we how can we stay in the Balkans and help if we don't even have our primary existential, you know, care taken if you want to live in the profession, if you want to work in the profession you are at. So um, how to how to overcome this hurdle and then actually work on it. So I'm just, I don't know, trying to, you know, spark some um, comments. Thank okay. you. And Thank sorry. You, I'd like to give the floor to Elion. Can you hear us, Mr. Kolchaku? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Please be brief in your comment or your question. Okay, thank you so much for giving me the flow. Uh, I am Elian Kolchanko uh, and I am from Kosovo. And I just wanted to say a very short comment uh, of, uh, of what was said in this panel. Uh, I was uh, devoted to the idea to live and stay in the Western Balkans. And uh, this was the reason why I, cho I chose to stay uh, in the region to study uh, for my master's and also for my bachelor thesis. But now, uh, since I see that in my country, in Kosovo, only in the last week, uh, two million euros were stolen by the, go the government and no one is giving the responsibility. What can I say? How can I stay in a country like this? that is in, in the Western Balkans. Or so the same situation is also in Albania when I was for two years for my master's. So uh, the question is, how can I stay in a country that is, uh, it is corrupted, that 
its own government is corrupted and uh, you cannot find a job that you want. And yes, I have a master's right now and I don't, I work as a freelance. I work as a freelance. I have a master's on public relations and I have a BA on journalism. And I have both of them with the highest average, 10. And I, I don't have a, a job that I, that I like, I would like. And I have so many opportunities for uh, the re uh, other countries that are in the EU. But what can I do in this situation? This is the question. Thank you so much. And I understand the frustrations that all young people from the region want to you know, stay in the region, but they are pushed away because of these uh, problems. So let me go back to the panel to address these issues. And I'd like to apologize that I did not give the floor to Daphina and Lorenta before for the previous round of questions. So let me start with you. Please, Daphina and Lorenta, be brief in your remarks. Daphina, let's start with you. It's very brief. Thank you very much for the question. It's a very important one. First of all, the, the first challenge, I, I'm going to uh, mention two examples. And then, but firstly, I want to mention the challenges that we face to ensure this inclusiveness. It's very difficult to find those people in their communities and match them with the organizations which are already advocating for their rights and for their better conditions. So everything we could do as a national youth structure, as an umbrella, is to go in the local level, physically, organize meetings, talk with the organizations which are representing them, try to get in touch with local level institutions to find more data because it's also a, 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 an issue of data and information and how well these people are recognized and they are somewhere, I don't know, identified. This is the, the first point. The second was to involve these organizations in our uh, GA, in our General Assembly, by explaining our mission, our vision, uh, how important for us is to have a colorful dialogue and to have the participation of these groups which do represent the interest of people, of young people coming from vulnerable groups from marginalized groups, uh, from uh, minorities, and etc. When we created this first strategy uh, in for three-year term, uh, we ensured to put there a specific chapter on social security and inclusion. When the, it was them by themselves designing and raising their voice upon their concerns and how they would like to see the policy making cycle address the, their issues much better, then by developing their capacities in our general assembly. They also started to feel much more competent with, with, with much more capacities and applied for, 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 for leadership positions. And this is how they, they started to advocate their, their issues better. I know quite well that the transition um, in, their, in the independent living of these people, young people in their community is a very difficult one. The transition from education to employment of these young people is much more difficult compared with the others. Um, the recognition of the value of non-formal education and non-formal learning when it comes to these target groups, it's very important. It's not only about the content, but the, organ the youth organizations, the youth workers have to develop their pedagogical skills and their pedagogical equipments in order to uh, fit to their profiles, to their understanding, and to find a simple language as well with, with these um, communities and with these young people. We try to, to organize systematically consultation processes to create platforms for the access in the information. These are, let's say, some methods how we have been trying to integrate these young people in our work. This was a, the, the example of National Youth Congress, which operates in national level. But we have the Regional Youth Cooperation Office, which has put this aspect highly in their values, in their mission, in their strategic development, when they design the grants and the programs, they keep in mind to involve not only by numbers, but also in a programmative way, the issues which do concern young people coming from marginalized groups. I don't know if you would be satisfied with this answer, but I would like maybe to get in touch with you more and to share from my experiences, this time is limited, and um, to, to have exchange upon this. Because the, the, the question when it comes to this is, how to identify and how to make sure that we are properly addressing their uh, natural original challenges because these young people are quite difficult to be tackled uh, they used to be not those very very active ones maybe with a lot of potential to to contribute and and, and to speak upon themselves but maybe not with the proper capacities and it's our duty to create a proper frame of, of, of identifying and involving them Thank you. Oh, thank you. Lorenta, do you have any comment on this? 
Um, I will just say that uh, I agree what uh, Daphina just mentioned earlier. And yeah, what is good for young people, uh, speaking on behalf uh, as a youngster here, is like to, to be more pushy, to get involved into the activities, uh, especially to the ones that are organized from the institution. I mean, in the local and, and central level, there are strategies. In Kosovo, we do have quotas and everything. So those youngsters need to use them so they can get involved in any sort of activities that are organized uh, in the field. That's okay. right. I'd like to uh, give the floor now to Genoveva to, to respond to this question, but I have my personal question as someone that comes from the region but has lived half of my life abroad. How can we get Elion and Marina back to the region? They want to go back. How, where do we start reforms? What do we do for this you know, circle of migration? Because I think the aim also of this conference and the panel is not only to slow emigration, but also how to foster circular migration, you know, get back the brain to the region. And you heard all the level of frustration that young people have. And that will uh, follow on with the question that we had from uh, Ms. Steinacker that she talks about political and economic elites and asks the questions if they really want to change and reform and what the European Union will do if they do not comply with those changes. Genoveva. Difficult Thank you very much, Lorena. The first thing I want to say, first, we do understand the frustration of all the young people that are explaining why they are somewhere else studying the region. We fully understand and we fully share that frustration. But at the same time, I want to say that every time that the youth activists that I meet with the youth every time before COVID, I went to the region, or now I do it by VTC. I always ask uh, if there's an asset this region has is the talent in their youth. So please, I mean, be resilient. Don't, don't let yourself uh, be demotivated. I think it's very important that you stay and that your voice is heard and that you're, you know, you keep your spirit to really want to make a change. If the youngsters don't want to make a change, who is going to help us make it the change we want to see in the region? Uh, it is clear that uh, uh, our enlargement policy, you know, is a policy that has rewards if you go faster. So you open more chapters, you close more chapters, and that if you don't move in the right direction, it goes more slow. It is a policy as well where our funding is attached to better performance. I mean, we have had in the last financial perspective, which is going to uh, finish to, uh, in 2020, uh, performance rewards giving to the countries that were more reformist. And the last one was giving only to North Macedonia and to Albania, because we're the only countries that we saw su sufficient evidence that they were advancing more on reforms than others. So I think it's a policy that has sticks and has carrots. And it, it, it is a clear policy. And it is a policy which basically reward uh, progress and encourage progress. Because, like I said, you know, we, there is no shortcut for the EU accession. It's a merit-based process. It's when you meet the conditions of, uh, to be a member state that you are there. So I think the, the, the ingredients are there. The, the, what is important now is to, to make sure that, of course, the, the region and the authorities and institutions are able to, 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 to take those ingredients and, and, and run with them. I can have only sympathy for the colleague, for the youngsters that are selling. I cannot live with the salary of this. I cannot. And that's why if you saw the enlargement uh, report this year on, that we adopted on the 6th of October has been together adopted with an economic and investment plan, which is an impressive uh, good news for the region that made Commissioner Varheli and myself go to the region immediately on the 7th. I mean, we adopted this on the 6th. And on the seventh, despite COVID, we went to the six uh, capitals to present this and to really put 9 billion euro on the table that in addition can generate 20 billion euro more because we have new financing instruments like guarantees for the region. I mean, who? Uh, this is a clear uh, uh, message of hope for the region. We want to bring significant amount of funding to do the productive investments that will create jobs and economic growth for this region that will help close this uh, gap of economic convergence. But if you read, and I hope you read this, this economic and investment plan, it has three elements there. 
The first, we want to bring this substantive amount of funding for productive investment, for investment in the rural areas, for investment in infrastructures, for investment in greening the economies, for investment in the digital agenda. And I want to talk about those two because the green and the digital paradigms will be the, the, the core store of the EU Green Deal as well. And if you saw this investment plan comes together with the, with the Green Agenda for the Western Balkans. All that comes from the request we got from the, from the civil society and from the youth of the region. They wanted to see this coming for the region, for them to have hope. The second pillar of this, of this investment plan is a very clear message. The region, you have to do the reforms that are necessary. The reforms, including on public procurement, on, 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 on fighting nepotism, corruption, rule of law, because those are the conducive conditions so that the countries can really uh, benefit from this a massive amount of investment that the EU is willing to bring to the region. But there's a third element in this uh, communication, is we bring the fund, you countries bring the reforms, and the region together bring the market because this is a very small uh, market. Every country has two, three, uh, four million people, I mean, eight million, I mean, this is not significant to attract the sort of solid investors we want to come to the region. So the barriers have to be out. The World Bank has estimated that the moment we have a regional market, we could have even 7% GDP growth. And this is a very clear message as well. We need a common regional market. And I hope that the leaders of this region that are working together with the Regional Cooperation Council and with the assistance of the commission will bring that plan to the SOFIA summit uh, on the 10th of November. Because this is the only one, this is the three tandem. You know, we bring the funding, the countries bring the reforms and the region bring the market. A market which doesn't have barriers for free circulation of goods, of people, of services and of capital. Those are the four freedoms of the EU internal market. And the, the earlier the, the region is able to create that space in the region, the easier it is for us in, in the EU to link the region towards the EU internal market and to get the region ready for accession. So I think this is a very powerful message for all the people in the region. And I want to emphasize in particular the green and the digital paradigms. Because if we think about the digital paradigm, the region has a lot of talent. This is an area where the youth can make a difference of, of the region. And this is an area where you don't need a lot of capital. You just need your talent to come. But in addition to that, you know, if you look at the European investment uh, and the economic and investment plan that the European Union has put on the table, talks about a flagship of human capital. And that talks about the youth, that talks about the women, that talks about all the assets that we need to bring that, that um, element in the economy, which is, of course, conditions for the youth to want to be back in the region. And I am extremely uh, positive. I mean, we have as well offer a youth guarantee that is exactly inspired of what we're doing to create jobs for the young in the European Union, because I mean, uh, I can talk about a country I know best where the youth unemployment is extremely high. So, and we're using exactly the same mechanisms. The, the economic and investment plan is bringing those mechanisms mechanism to the region. So I, I, I can only share the, the, the pain and the frustration, but I want to make sure that we don't end just on that, that we look at the opportunities that we have ahead of us and that we run with them. Thank you. Thank you, Genoveva. Thank you for, very, for this very positive message and also the optimism that you're bringing. And I think that Europeanization is the main driver for reforms and strengthening of institutions in the region. So uh, the region is lucky to be part of Europe and have that vision of becoming uh, EU member. And I think what you pointed out regarding the economic and investment plan is crucial. I wish we had learned and read and you know heard the leaders from the region talk more about this because I think this is a game changer. This is a game changer, even in the post COVID-19 uh, you know, situation where we might look at some near shoring in Europe and there could be opportunities for a regional market, as you mentioned, to become really what the Visegrad countries were in the early twenties. But you have to have all the indicators, you have to have the right business climate in order to start. And I know that young people that are frustrated, but also politicians, try some time to scapegoat the slow process of the European Union, which I don't agree with that. Uh, European Union has been doing you know, the best. Uh, and I think the political message that was sent that both uh, Albania and North Macedonia were decided to open negotiation in the midst of the biggest crisis for the European Union 
I think it's a very strong political message. So we should not uh, forget about that. So we should not, of course, looking at the problems, but also looking at the opportunities out there. And please, I'd like to give the floor to Valeska if there are any other questions to be, um, to be read from the chat. Yes, uh, thank you, Vagona. Um, I have one last question coming from Monica uh, Roman from Bucharest University of Economic Studies, and it's also going uh, to, uh, to Genoveva. And she asks whether there are any effective EU policies for encouraging return migration from the EU to the Western Balkan countries uh, in order to decrease uh, brain drain, as this uh, may be beneficial for the countries. Okay, so what I would like to do, and I think if there are no more, um, I think there's another hand, Anna Plavsic, so maybe we'll take her question too. And after that, I'd like to give the floor for the final comments to all the panelists. Anna, can you hear us? If not, okay, I see you, but we cannot hear you. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Um, I'm currently a Bubuk trainee in the European Commission and DG DAFCO, and my question is for Ms. Calavera, actually. So basically, I, I encourage and I'm very happy about the European Investment Plan for the Western Balkans and for all the reforms that it's going to bring, hopefully. But how is DG NIR and also the Commission as a whole going to ensure that the corruption, which is ingrained in the societies of Western Balkans, is not leading to these reforms being only superficial. Because as we have heard from other participants as well, unfortunately, the governments, yes, the money is going also to the people, but the great majority of that money is being used, is landing in the pockets of government officials. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. So uh, Genovea, we'd like to start with you and uh, responding to these questions, but also your final comments for this session. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Barbona. I think you said it. I mean, the best guarantee to create conditions for uh, you know uh, the the people to come back to the region is to continue working on the European agenda, is to continue making sure that you know the same rights and privileges and the same you know advantages that the EU citizens have in the EU, the the citizens of the region can enjoy. I think why the people want to live in Germany or, or in Austria is because they, they, they find things there that they don't find in the region. So I am a strong believer that what we are doing with enlargement policy for this region is the best recipe to help the region, you know, create the conditions for people to stay home. And that's what we want to see. Um, at the same time, I mean, I want to, to, to really make a clear that uh, all our programs, there's no one single program, you know, we, this is a cross-cutting program. So everything we're doing across the board is to create those conditions. And certainly it goes first and foremost on all our efforts for institution building, because this is important. It's really important that institutions, the public administrations, the governance of the countries are up and running to tackle corruption, nepotism, and all the different issues that have been raised. Second, we, we have to inject the money to the economy. And well, when you put it very clear, in the midst of the COVID crisis, this year in March, the EU decided to open accession. But not only that, the EU brought the communication that fed you know, the, the Zagreb summit between the leaders of the European Union and the leaders of the Western Balkans. And we put 3.3 billion euro on the table to help the region to confront the crisis. And this 3.3 billion, you, if you look at the, in the social uh, you know, accounts of our uh, ambassadors, the heads of the delegation in the region, every day we're doing deliveries to the region, whether it's in health, whether it's injecting economy in the, in the national banks, the local banks, so that they can give loans. We have changed all our programming so that we can even give loans to the people that have, they cannot pay the previous loans. We, we have been there by the side of this region, treating them as partners. We have opened mechanisms that were exclusively of use of our member states to the region. The region is now together sitting in the, in the health uh, security committee of the, of, of the European Union discussing how do we coordinate our, our response to COVID. The, the, the region has been invited to be part of our joint procurement agreement so that we can have critical mass to buy medicines, to buy vaccinations. It's the only region in the world that has been associated to this level of, of closeness to the European Union. So I think our, our 
commitment to the region is out of the question. And after that, you know, only six months later, we have brought this nine billion economic investment plan. So the, the ingredients are there. We need to make it work because it's true that the challenges are very, are very high. I, I don't agree when, when people tell me that uh, the, the EU money goes just to the uh, pockets of the politicians. I mean, I have a lot of check and balances. And every time we, we find things like this, we, we just go into court, we get the money back. So I am sorry. Most, I would say, almost all the EU money gets to the programs and the projects that uh, hit the ground. A different thing is that I do agree that there's a lot of money from the national budgets that might be diverted. But please, let's not confuse the matters. We have a lot of check and balances. We have organizations looking into corruption. And, and, and certainly, I don't want um, to be associated to any comment of that sort, because that's not true and that's not right. I think if you think that I have to convince our EU taxpayers' money to adopt, uh, you know, to, to bring 14 billion euro for the instrument for pre-accession, because we're talking about nine for uh, strategically for, for, uh, for productive investment, but the instrument for pre-accession that we're still discussing with our authorities in the council and in the, in the parliament, we, the commission has asked for 14.5 uh, billion. This is billions that don't go to the European Union citizens. So I don't accept, I cannot tell my citizens that it goes to the pockets of your product. It's not the case. And I think it's very important that we're all collectively responsible not to uh, create this feeling because this is not right. And I can tell you that when things happen of that sort, we certainly fight them in court, in justice, in putting people behind jails and recovering the EU taxpayers' money. Uh, but certainly th these things happen. These things happen in our EU member states and that's why we need to have effective judiciary, effective police, effective investigations of financial flows. All these are part of the institutional uh, building efforts that we have to build in the countries so that we can combat things that unfortunately happen in the region and happen in our EU member states as well. I have to say, and I think it's very important that we all look at things, the challenges are paramount. And, but you know, the, the, the opportunities again of bringing the choice, because I think this is what we have to look at. Migration should be a choice. You should want to go for personal or for family reasons or for uh, professional interest to opt to be able to, to work uh, anywhere in, in, in the European Union. And certainly that will be one of the advantages of being a EU, EU member state when you're part of, of our family. But it shouldn't be you know, a, an obligation because you have no future in your country. You can count on the European Union and you can count on the European Commission that I represent to try to make sure that we get to that moment in which migrating from your country is an option. And I want to remind the, the, the Balkan barometer in which uh, to this question, uh, would you be willing to stay in the region if there would be a market that would give you a job in the region before you go to the EU? The response was yes, highly, you know, a high percentage of the response. So that's why we continue pushing and insisting on the leaders of the region to really look at how can they work together and bring that vision of the regional market that provides the possibility for the citizens of the region to be able to stay in the region close home. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Genoveva, for injecting some hope in the panel, but also thank you to the European Commission, a geopolitical European Commission now in the words of the president uh, that um, are really injecting some much needed money in the region a money that's based on democratic standards and values. And actually that is even more important uh, than some money that might be injected from other nefarious actors. We did not mention those uh, issues much in our panel that are non-transparent and that will bring you know, weaker and non-transparent governance in, in, in the country. So I think we have to talk more about this and we have to let people know and communicate with them of how important the role of the EU is and what uh, they're doing. I'd like to give the floor to Marco for your final comments, Marco. Yes, thanks. Uh, I briefly want to come back to uh, what, what uh, Genoveva said that I mentioned that funds, EU funds support elites. I'm pretty sure I never said that. Uh, and this is recorded session. So, 
basically, what I said is that EU should commit to diverting financial uh, aid from governments to civil society in those countries uh, whose administrations breach basic democratic norms. And uh, I, I see that this, this would be the case with many Western Balkan countries. So more funding must be provided to protect civil society against uh, 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 state repression uh, in, in shrinking democratic space. Basically, that's it. Um, and I'm, I'm, I would also like to commend uh, the EU for providing this economic investment plan of eight billion, uh, 9 billion euros. But at the same time, uh, Croatia alone is drawing uh, 8 billion euros from the uh, European funds. Uh, but has that stopped migration uh, from Croatia? No, uh, it is actually surging. It's at the highest level that it has been over the past decades. And uh, so although I'm not a, a, an expert on migration uh, studies, uh, I, can, I can draw on uh, what uh, Dusan Relic has said. He's, I see him also in the list of speakers. And he said somewhere that uh, history is history of, of migrations. And in this regard, uh, uh, we, we cannot and we should not uh, try and stop migrations. Uh, Valbonella asked, how can we or how can EU bring met, back Marina or Elion uh, to the region? They cannot. Only Marina and Elbion can return to the region should they want to do so. And uh, basically, uh, what I see is that uh, uh, both the Western Balkan countries themselves uh, and the EU should try to understand the implications of migrations for the future. So how these countries should live in a, 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 a shrinking demographic situation and how they uh, will continue to live in uh, aging uh, uh, demographic population. So uh, talking about circle of migration, I'm not, I'm not actually convinced it can work. I've seen so many students coming to Graz on uh, short uh, study stays, but basically their biggest concern is uh, how to provide, how to find a way to stay longer. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, I would be very cautious to say that it can work, but what I see uh, as crucial is to facilitate stay of uh, those professions that are actually uh, 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 crucial for the region. So how to maintain uh, uh, professionals, uh, professionals coming from uh, medical studies, from education, etc., to stay in the Balkans. And one way would be uh, that the EU countries and other countries actually uh, offer financial compensation uh, for the brain drain, because basically they are getting a lot of uh, highly skillful uh, labor force that has been schooled elsewhere. They are coming at uh, cost free for the EU countries. So, in a way, offering this kind of financial compensation should be used to keep uh, 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 medical workers, education, uh, uh, educational professionals, and, and others in the region itself and uh, uh, migration will continue, whatever, whatever the EU or we come up with as a solution. Thank you, Marco. Daphina, your final comments. I just wanted to say that um, young people and youth sector doesn't live in a, in a vacuum. We are connected with every kind of development happening in social, political and then and, and economical sphere. So basically the young people expectations or, or attitude is reflecting the, uh, how to say the confusion and, 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 the, and the colorful emotion that are caused by so many factors. And it's very difficult to have a detailed answer or a detailed uh, recipe, how we are going to figure things out. I just want to mention that Albania is going through two very important reforms in injustice and electoral reform. You previously made me a very good question upon are the politicians listening to you? I would answer this by um, saying that maybe they would listen much better if they would be fully dependent by our votes. So if you see how the political parties have, have, have been functioning, not only in, in Albania, but in Western Balkan region, is that the candidate, the people which are representing us in the parliament or in city councils are, do not have a direct bond with the citizens. This is the first thing, the, the, the democracy within the political parties, the democracy within the political system 
the bond between the electorate and the elected people, it's a crucial, it's a basement for us to feel free and, and to feel motivated to have a certain contribution in their programs, in their electoral campaigns, and so on and so forth. So this is what I'm trying to say is that the fact that we don't see now in, in, in politics the involvement of, of so many young people or in their political rhetoric talking about young people doesn't mean that there is no need and doesn't mean that we don't have great young people living in, in, in our countries and in our societies. But there are some political, technical, legal things to be fixed first. And if we are living in Albania, for example, or in Western Balkan region, then we, we should be there 100%. I don't have a concern with young people which are leaving. They have a lot of motivations which are quite understandable and quite legitimate. I was born in a foreign country. I was raised in a foreign country and I do live in Albania. But I have, I have a principle. If I'm going to stay somewhere and to live somewhere, I'm going to fully act as a citizen, as a person, as everything. So it doesn't matter if I'm staying in Albania or in Africa. I'm going to fight every day because it's an everyday fight and it's not an everyday sleep. And I fully understand all the difficulties. I'm not talking now as an idealist. I'm talking in a realistic perspective. And um, as to, to conclude this, I would say that uh, it's very important to keep young people highly in the agenda of decision makers and every program that the government is trying to build up or to design for the social development to reinforce the regional agenda and regional cooperation. Um, Resources are needed, especially when it comes to those measures targeting education and unemployment, with particular focus on young people that need to get back into education or catch up the progress and processes and through their development paths. I would say that if there is a need for better alignment with EPA programming and implementation, including efficient national implementation structures with proper rules and procedures, and the government should move it stands from dialogue with civil society into partnership with civil society in all stages of policy cycle and which are relevant and to exercise such principles, to exercise in a systematic way. And we should monitor and participate in a systematic way. There is no, no other way which I can, which, which I can see for, for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Daphina, for your comments. You brought the point of uh, dem democratization of political parties and inclusiveness in the political parties. I think that'll be a topic of a new panel starting from the beginning, but you're right. It starts there, uh, the inclusiveness also of young people uh, and, other, and other groups. And uh, just listening to you, Daphina, listening to Lorenta, but also listening to all the young people uh, throughout the day uh, of the conference. You know, I really feel hopeful for, uh, for the region. I feel optimistic. Because I think the biggest advantage and the biggest treasure that the region has is exactly the young people, you know, human capital. And this is where it needs to be invested. Lorenta, your final comment. Thank you. Uh, what I would suggest, and I will kindly ask from uh, first my, my government and the governance from the Western Balkans is uh, to give space to young people here. Yes, they can do things for us. They can bring back uh, Mariana. They can create the space for Elian. They need, all they need to do is to implement the extra documents that they created by themselves. So that will make our life more easier and we would love to work in our countries. Uh, just by making us own the, the, the processes in local and central level and create space for us, the space that is already promised to us. Uh, as for the young people, uh, I do know as a young person that we don't need nobody else to come and to teach us as youngsters what to do. Uh, I'm talking for like maybe international missions or somebody else. We already know our problems. We are facing with them in daily basis. So we have to make ourselves more visible to, to raise our voice and to ask for our rights and for our place. So thank you so thank much. You. And that's from well, me. Well, thank you, Lorenta. But, uh, you know, nobody really is going to give open space for you and the younger people. I think younger people should look for that, should fight for that, you know, by raising the voice, by raising awareness and being, you know, asking, demanding uh, their governments to be included. Nobody will offer the space to young people. They have to, I think, you know, uh, fight for it. 
And with this, I would like to thank you all for this uh, terrific uh, uh, panel. So we had all perspectives here. I'm so glad we went a little bit, even almost 15 minutes over, uh, but there's still so much interest uh, from our participants. So thank you very much again. Uh, thank you for taking time. Genoveva, thank you very much. We saw that a lot of questions were, you know, uh, were directed to you because I think you are the face of the European Union, but also that shows that the trust in the European Union is very strong strong. And that's why people are looking for uh, responses uh, from, from the EU institutions and from you personally. So before I close this, I would like to give the floor to Valeska for her uh, closing comments. Thank you very much, uh, Valbona, and I promise I, I, I won't be long. I would just like to use this opportunity on behalf of us organizers to thank all speakers and moderators today. And I would also like to thank all participants. I know it's been a very long day. We have been live since 9 a.m. and still we have around 90 participants dialed in. So thank you very much for your interest. Um, coming up next is a short film, uh, One Way Ticket, What Leads Young People from the Western Balkans into Emigration and What Brings Them Back. It was produced by Branka Pavlovic and Snezhana Bogavac uh, with help of Krenare Gashi, Kaznici and Tomica Sto Stojanovic um, specifically for this, uh, for this conference. Uh, you can also find the film in the cinema of our conference platform if you would like to rather watch it later, as you can find all other videos. Um, I very much look forward to tomorrow. We have two more interesting panels, one on joint measures to foster circular migration and remigration, and one on the role of diaspora and regional relations. And then we will close with a few spotlights uh, on, on the conference takeaways. And I also look forward to, to welcoming again um, Ambassador Susanne Schütz tomorrow, um, who um, will contribute also a few concluding remarks and key takeaways also of the Foreign Office from this conference. So I very much look forward to, to, to to seeing all you online uh, tomorrow again and wish you a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you again.